talk about is from Romans 9, which was the starting point of my deconstruction journey. Up until the point that I read and studied and chewed on the words in Romans 9, I believed in a God who created all people, gave them free will, and that he wanted all people to be saved, but he couldn't violate their free will to save them. And that it was the most loving thing he could do to give people freedom. And within that freedom, they could either choose him and go to heaven, or they could reject him and go to hell. And that would be entirely their choice. I was an evangelist, so I believed in going out to my communities, spreading the word, trying to win as many souls as possible because I looked around and there were people going to hell and I didn't want that to happen. But when I was 17 years old, I was introduced to the concept of Calvinism. And when I was introduced to this, I said, no way. There's no way that God created people just to go to hell. And then I read Romans 9, starting in verse 16. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort. But on okay, so all right, hold on. Pharaoh, Wait a second. I raised you up hold on. Very... What in the world? It does not, therefore, depend on human desire. What is she reading? All right, so let's go to Romans nine. I think it's a mistake to start at verse sixteen, but whatever. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardens. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why does he yet find fault? For who has resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Has not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath? fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory of the, on the vessels of mercy, which he has afore prepared unto glory. Now let's fast forward this stuff here. Oh, I guess what she reads 24 and 25, okay. Even us whom he has called, not the, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. You know, I should have kept reading. I guess I didn't. I read that kind. I stopped when I shouldn't have stopped. Oh, who cares? And he saith also in O.C., I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. Now, there's a period. Is that where she stops? The objects of his wrath prepared for destruction. What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for his glory, even us who meet God's mercy? Meaning, there is nothing about you that can come to God and choose. God has to choose you. That's right. God has to choose you. And think about what Jesus says. He says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. Now, I've, I've heard fools say, Well, this he's only talking to the, the twelve disciples. No, he's talking to you and me. In John 15, verse 16, he says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained 
you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name he may give it you and I mean this is important to understand I mean if you think you have the power to choose eternal life you are dead wrong in Mark 13 what I say unto you I say to all watch now what she's saying here is true that we don't choose God God chooses us it says in verse 18 therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden when Christians talk about you have a hardened heart against God the Bible says that God's the one that hardened it and then it, it, it even goes on to ask well then why does God still blame us you know if, if he created this way how come he blames us and Paul is saying who are you to question God how can the clay question the potter and ask why have you made me like this it says what if God although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction if he has decided he wants to create you just to destroy you then he's gonna do that and that's his right you don't get to claim <laughs> really that's what she's saying is right it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God to question that and realizing this changed everything about my perspective of God realizing this made me see a God who did not desire people to be saved but instead uh, yeah so by her own words there's two things if I can remember two things I want to mention here by her own words she condemns herself right. by her own words she's condemning herself she now sees a different God a God that does not want people to be saved All right. that's number one now she thinks she might be saying something else but that's exactly if you take her word for it she's seen a different God and she's seen a new God and a God that uh, that will not have mercy on her this made me see a God who did not desire people to be saved. now she sees a God that does not desire people to be saved now she's not looking at God Almighty she's looking at a different God uh, you could even say this she's looking to the devil now because the devil doesn't want you to be saved and so she now sees the devil All right. and so the scripture is very clear God is not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance I thought that's what the Bible said ah what happened uh oh oh, oh now I know where it's at hold on um, Mandela strikes again. No, just kidding. Second uh, Peter, chapter three, verse nine: The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but He is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance God is not willing that any should perish God wants us all to be saved well why aren't all saved well this is the condemnation condemnation it's a hard word to say this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men and women love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil and so God wants us all to be saved God wants us all to be born of the Spirit of God that's why he made us with this void that can only be filled with his spirit in order for us to have that void filled we must have faith we must believe 
in the Lord Jesus Christ because we need a Savior and without that faith in God we will be cut off we will cut out we will be left out however you want to describe it right so there's a reason why God made us the way he has made us there's a reason why God has done all the things that he's done all throughout history and there's a reason why this world's coming to an end because God is creating that separation between good and evil between light and dark and therefore uh, all darkness will be cut off and I, I think a great parable is the parable of the wheat and the tares it, it, of Matthew 13 because you have to let the two grow together and then when it's harvest time that's when you make the separation at the end of the world I think it has to be this way I mean this is how God made it God explains it very very well <laughs> in great detail exactly why and what's gonna happen and so now you have an opportunity today to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ because you know yourself that you need a Savior you know it. everybody knows it but because people love darkness men and women love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil he saved but instead creates people as puppets does what he wants with them and then tells them you're not allowed to question it that is just in direct contradiction to that uh, that's not even she just made that up she lied but I think you know the point that I already made is she says herself that she sees a new God let's just do this way and a God that doesn't want her to be saved right, some ask and it shall be given you seek and you shall find knock and it shall be open unto you this woman obviously is turned to the devil and creates people as puppets does what he wants with them and then tells them you're not allowed to question it yeah <laughs> uh, you're not allowed to question it ask and it shall be given you just don't question it and what kind of sense is that anyways um, but what led me to this video here from two months ago is I typed in Bible Scholar you know I want to see what the experts say yeah I think if you really looked into it <laughs> you realize these guys are experts they're not scholars they're liars and you should never ever really you should never ever put that label on you or another man the only requirement if you want to be a Bible expert scholar just believe the Bible that you hold in your hands it's got every thing that you need all the information you could possibly ever ask for is right there in the Bible that you hold in your hands alright so somehow doing this or maybe it was just a regular maybe I did this here there she is there she is we got phony baloney after phony baloney and are these guys experts you think this woman here is an expert a guy that looks like an expert but come on man uh, there you go there's an expert I mean come on man really if you're looking for experts and scholars to tell you what God says you're in trouble you're in big trouble right so again I just want to emphasize the importance of faith now I've picked on this skip skippy whatever his last name is I've picked on him before but now let's pick on him again because 
This is from nine hours ago. This guy's beating the drum. And unfortunately for me, I've sat here and listened to 20 minutes of this crap. How, however long. He doesn't say nothing. I'm waiting for him to say something. What he says is that there's a coming 1,000 years of peace. And he goes into uh, philosophy and storytelling and he never explains the Bible or what he means you know by a thousand years of peace I'm not sure what I, I forget what I was going to share here but just to uh, make this clear alright so the idea that there's going to be a thousand years of peace is it's stupid for one it's not logical at all all right, and what this guy is going to say, I don't know if he's going to say it here in the clip that I'm going to show you, is that there's going to be a thousand years of peace. At the end of the thousand years, then comes Jesus with all his saints to execute judgment on earth. What? If, how can there be a thousand years of peace if all that is on the earth are unsaved people? There's going to be a thousand years of peace among unsaved people? No, that's not possible. It's not possible at all. What, what, what kind of junk is this? And it's very typical of these Hollywood movie, uh, movie worshippers, the people that worship Nicolas Cage and all those superstars or whatever they call them in Hollywood, movie stars. They worship them as though they are gods. And so therefore they preach things that seem like Bible doctrine. They preach it in uh, coordination with what they're watching on television or in the movie theater. So, and they're just saying to hell with what the Bible says. And, okay, let's listen to what he says. Now they'll say, yeah, I know what you're thinking, but he was bound at the cross. Well, it sounds so spiritual, but he was not bound at the cross. He was sentenced at the cross. All right, so he's talking about Satan trying to, he's been going on for about 30 minutes here, trying to talk about the first three verses of Revelation 20. All right, and it surely by now you're familiar with what I teach on this I'll go over it again Revelation 20 and I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottom was put in a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottom was put and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season all right so what what happened oh well, I don't know where I'm at here here we go you think Satan is bound yeah I, I don't see him as being bound now they'll say yeah I know what you're thinking but he was bound at the cross oh it sounds so spiritual but he was not bound at the cross he was sentenced at the cross he was sentenced at the cross. This is his own words. He was sentenced at the cross. Alright. Um, I'm not going to nitpick that at all. But going off of your own words, Satan is sentenced at the cross. So, I can't even twist it into... To fit your meaning here, I can't do it. I can't. Um, I would have to nitpick in order to dissect what he's saying. All right, so <laughs> he's sentenced at the cross. So in your 
view the skips view here he's saying that all right so satan was uh, sentenced all right it's like satan stood before the judge and judge said okay you're going to be sentenced to death but uh we're going to wait a thousand years or so before we punish you and so according to skip satan is out there running loose right now and uh, it's like he's out on bond or something even though the sentence has already been imposed it doesn't make sense that's not how the legal system works maybe it does where he's at i don't know who cares he's got it all wrong anyway but he hasn't served time yet now he serves time thousand years thousand years he'll be you just kind of you just kind of skipped over that part in your view skip you have satan sentenced at the cross of jesus and now what well, how do you describe this period of time right now well he's an escaped criminal i guess so when jesus comes back in your view skip he's going to be locked up for a thousand years and then what end of a sentence <laughs> and then he's going to be let go or are you saying that he's going to be bound for a thousand years and then the punishment is going to be you know he's going to be on death row for a thousand years and then at the end he's going to be they're going to cut his head off or whatever i mean you still got a problem because right now in your view skip he's not bound he's not he's not locked up he's not bound but he had he's been sentenced that's not consistent with any legal system that I'm aware of he'll be bound for a thousand years so he is not bound if Satan is bound then why in Acts chapter 5 verse 3 does Peter say to Ananias Satan has filled your yeah so again skip this is like you're completely ignorant of the Bible and not just Revelation 20, but the entire Bible. All right, so let's go over this because uh, Skip, he's pounding this drumbeat and he's speaking vanity. Jeremiah 23, verse 16, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. That's exactly what we see going on today more than ever before. All right, and let no man deceive you with vain words. Now, if you want, if you did want somebody to to deceive to deceive you with vain words, listen to this guy. Wow. I, you know, I mean, at forty, at forty-six, there, a half an hour later, he's not said a single thing. Hasn't said anything at all. So let's just get to it and yeah I'm gonna go over I'm gonna explain this very clearly very simply what we're reading here and I saw I John saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit oh, I'm sorry and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So if we go to Revelation chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, if you listen to Skip here, he'll go 10, 12 minutes talking about, oh, I think it's the angel Gabriel, or the angel Michael, and he'll start talking about Michael, and this and that, and all this, and all you go throughout the Bible where it says in Daniel 12, this and that, and blah, 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 and the next thing you know, and, they, and then you've forgotten what the heck he was talking about to begin with. It doesn't matter who the angel was here in Revelation 20. If it mattered, it'd tell you. It's not the point of what's being written here. <clears throat> That's not the point of what's going on here. If you understand Revelation chapter 1, just the very first verse. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, 
to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. He sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So the angel is going to show John things which must shortly come to pass. And what do we got here? An angel coming down from heaven. In other words, angel. An angel is showing John a thing that must shortly come to pass. All right. So this is very important to understand because this is not a continuation of Revelation 19 at all. I don't know why people make that. Well, I do because they want to believe that Nicolas Cage is a god and that the Hollywood movies are the visions of God. They don't want to believe the Bible at all. And so you have to willfully ignore the simple, plain scripture. All right. So Revelation 20, verse uh, 3. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him. That he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So just from a logical standpoint, Satan is... Um, bound okay for this thousand year period and therefore we must conclude that he was not bound before this thousand year period and he will be let loose after this thousand year period now how do you, how would you explain this well it's very clear if you understand the rest of the Bible or the you know especially if you understand the Bible at all, all right. If you have any understanding whatsoever, you know that in the Old Testament there was one group of people, one nation of people. All right. It, I mean, if you know the story, you ought to know the story of Moses leading his people out of Egypt. And you, the, if you know that, then you should know there was one group of people in which the kingdom of God was with. All right, so it's one country, one group of people where the kingdom of God was. Now, all right, so think about this. You got one country. Outside of that one country was not the kingdom of God was not the kingdom of God outside of that country. Alright, so when we read Revelation 20 and it says that he was bound, set a seal upon him, then bound him a thousand years, then this would indicate that he was not bound before this happened. So outside of the nation of Israel, the nation of God, were the nations deceived by Satan. The kingdom of God was only within the people of God, the one country of God. Alright, pretty simple. Now, here comes an angel down from heaven, and he, and he binds Satan for a thousand years. Now, at the end of the thousand years, what happens? Well, at the end of the thousand years, it's the end of the world. <clears throat> and then what happens at the end of the world? Well, we know by reading the rest of the Bible that... Jesus Christ comes in the clouds of heaven at the end of the world, which is at the end of the thousand years. We know it by reading the rest of the Bible that we are lifted up in the air to meet the Lord. We know it by reading the rest of the Bible. And this is it's all over the place. 
And, you know, I'll tell you another thing. Uh, think about what Jesus says here in Matthew 24. You think um, he's ignorant, or do you think he's stupid? It's got to be one or the other. If you believe there's a thousand-year period coming after he comes in the clouds of heaven. And not only that, you have to call him a liar, don't you? I'm just if that's what you believe, if you believe Jesus is ignorant, stupid, and a liar, just be honest and say it. You know, I, I showed you this lady, Bible scholar lady. What I do? Close her video out already. At least this lady was honest. Now you think about that. Now she was being honest with what she believed. She wrong. She you know she believes in a God that doesn't want you to be saved. That's what she's wrong, but that's what she was honest about what she believes. Now you're uh, holding the Bible in your hand and you're pretending to be scholarly, pretending to be an expert and all this sort of stuff, and you got the beard and a smile and everything. Well, just be honest with what you believe, Robert Breaker. Just be honest. You think Jesus was ignorant, stupid, and a liar? Here, right here in Matthew 24, because he's asked specifically about the end of the world. The end of the world is when he comes in the clouds of heaven. That's what Jesus says. So those people that are teaching a thousand years after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, they're making Jesus out to be a liar. Because it wouldn't be the end of the world. It, you, it cannot, you cannot have two ends of the world. It's illogical. It's stupid. And it's ignorant. And if you're teaching it, you're a liar. The end of the world is the end of the world. It's the end of the world. You can't, if, if there's two ends of the world, then the first end of the world was not the end of the world. I, I just wonder, are you guys even capable of thinking? I wonder. And you really, you got no business teaching the Bible if you don't understand the simple end time theology just don't even teach it if you're that stupid and illogical it, because you're not doing any good you're not doing any good at all to not teach this correctly but of course this is exactly what we see going on in the world today, and this is what the Bible said would happen. <laughs> it's exactly what our Lord and Savior told us would happen. When he is asked, what is the sign of thy coming? What are the things that we're going to see that are going to indicate for us the end of the world? And the very first thing he says is, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. For many shall come in my name, saying, I, Jesus, am Christ, and shall deceive many. And on and on and on, we read about how the deception is going to get worse and worse and worse, all the way until the end. Now, you know that in 1 Thessalonians 4. At the end of the world, which is the trump of the God, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, same thing. At the last trump, the cometh the end, right? The last trump, the trumpet shall, shall sound, and the dead in Christ or the, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This happens at the last trump, at the end of the world, right? 
At the end of the world, we are lifted up in the air. We read this over and over all throughout the Bible. The angels, they shall gather together his elect. At the end of the world, we are lifted up in the air. And all the unsaved will be at our feet. Right? If all the saved are lifted up, you do a little bit of mathematics there. That all the people left on the earth, they're unsaved. Right. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science, man. What do you need a Bible scholar to tell you that? Simple. Again in Revelation 3 verse 9. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. We're up in the air. Now you could have figured all this out by reading Genesis chapter 3. When the Lord said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. If Jesus is going to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent, then Jesus is up above, and the serpent is down below. If we are Christ, then we're up above, and the, those that aren't Christ are down below. The saved are up, the unsaved are down. Right, just like what we read in Matthew 13, the parable of the wheat and the tares. And this is consistent all throughout the Bible. And now you're going to come along and change what the Bible says and present this Hollywood science fiction idea that there's a bonus thousand years for the unsaved. And you're going to call it a thousand years of peace among what unsaved people because at the end of the thousand years you have Jesus and his saints coming which would imply that all the saints are up in the air and that the only people on earth for a thousand years are unsaved people and your stuff doesn't make sense and it's as if you're completely ignorant of the rest of the Bible of the entire Bible that's why I say you got no business teaching this stuff if you're that far off. And all you're really doing is trying to sell a Hollywood movie. I mean, that's To me, that's what it looks like. You're trying to sell Hollywood as though Hollywood was the Word of God. And you're dismissing everything that's written in the Bible. Alright, so we know by the pair of... <laughs> Who explains it better than the Lord Jesus Christ? Who knows better than God Almighty that has done it all? Yeah, that's why I continuously say Jesus is the one that knows better than anybody that you'll ever hear speaking on this subject. So what Jesus says has to line up with what we read in Revelation 20. And vice versa. This It has to square. It has to square up. Right? So, when we are lifted up in the air, the saved are lifted up, then all that is left on the ground are the unsaved. And now, Satan has his time again. He's got, he's got his people all to himself once again, just like he had in the Old Testament. Right? This time, though, the one nation of God is not on earth. That one nation of God is up in heaven. All right. Now, we know that there was a Jerusalem on earth, whether you want to say there still is or not. It's irrelevant. Because the holy city now is above. All right, the holy city, which is Jerusalem, is above. Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So in the Old Testament, there was a Jerusalem on earth. Now there's a Jerusalem in heaven. All right. So, this stuff is so obvious. It's all throughout the Bible. It really is. So when... Jesus comes back, we are lifted up in the air. 
and we are the people of God we are the city of God right and it says here in verse um, where are we at here verse 6 or verse 8 I thought no verse 9 excuse me right, but we got to read the whole thing right and when the thousand years are expired Satan shall be loosed out of his prison that means he has the ability to um, deceive the nations because all the nations on earth are unsaved we're up in the air and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth Gog and Magog we can read about that in Ezekiel 38 to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea it's going to be a lot of them and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city where's the beloved city is it on earth no it's in heaven where are we at when at the end of the world are we on earth no we're up in the air we're in heaven with the Lord Jesus just as it says over and over all throughout the Bible at the end of the world when the trumpet shall sound the dead shall be raised incorruptible and the dead in Christ shall rise first and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord so this Jerusalem the, the uh, camp of the Saints it's above we're in the air and so Satan goes out and he gathers them together just like what we read about in Matthew 13 how uh, the parable of the wheat and the tares how the unsaved which are the tares they're gathered and they're they're bound in or binded or whatever in bundles to be burned but the wheat is gathered into my barn which is up in the air alright now when they are at our feet when, all right, when they are at our feet just like what we read in Revelation 3 verse 9 behold I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee All right, so they're gonna be at our feet and then what happens fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel this is the moment that Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent and when this happens then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory this is the end of the world this is the end of this world when all iniquity all evil all wickedness will be destroyed forever and ever it's pretty simple stuff man it's really very very simple and easy to understand any any dummy I don't care how low your IQ is you can be dumber than dog do and you could still understand the simplicity of the end of the world and the judgment of God it is appointed unto man once to die and then after this the judgment it's very simple anybody can understand it there's nothing you don't need to be an expert you don't need to be a scholar you don't need to have a library full of all these books all you have to do is believe the Bible that you hold in your hands it's always been about faith man it's always been about faith it's not a magic it's not rocket science you know it's very simple but then you got these liars deceivers full of wickedness who are preaching things that are not from God and they are doing it for the money and of course the root the love of money is the root of all evil 
right. and so I mean we it's amazing we see this these warnings all throughout the Bible and what do we see in the world today liars deceivers false prophets false teachers everywhere it's incredible in Titus 1 verse 11 whose mouths must be stopped who subvert whole houses teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake it over and over we've got example after example after example of one false teacher one liar deceiver after another it's incredible so anyways that's uh, that's my lesson for today uh, I want you guys to just believe the Bible that you hold in your hands believe it is from God because it is if you have a King James of course if you have a King James Bible you ought to know that it's directly from God it's not man's version of God's Word it is God's Word and it's so important so important to believe that first of all man cannot live on bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live if you don't have God's word you're in trouble man cannot live on bread alone man shall not live by bread alone that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of God well where can you find every word of God if you think it's in a foreign language you're in trouble buddy because you don't know that language nobody does we're all in trouble right now the Word of God transcends all languages for all time forever and ever and we can have faith in the Word of God and it's all it's so crucial to believe in uh, the Word of God I and mean, without it you're doomed right let's go to I'm gonna end it on this oh and I want to share something with you that's incredible you go to Hebrews 11 see all these yellow markers here on the right this is every single time the word faith is mentioned it's incredible 27 times and well not 27 times uh, it's 20 I think it's 25 times nevertheless it's a lot okay it's a lot in the Hebrews 11 now faith is a substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen and you notice here through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God by faith Abel by faith Enoch by faith Noah by faith Abraham it goes from the Old Testament all the way to New Testament this is everlasting life and it's all about faith the importance of faith it's incredible the power of faith and if you don't have faith you're gonna be blind you're not gonna be able to see it so again I, I implore you I encourage you to read and believe the Bible that you hold in your hands believe it's from God that's the key to being an expert and to being a scholar you've got all the information that you could ever ask for right there in the Bible it's more than enough you don't need to go outside of the Bible to be an expert on the Bible. Okay. All right. So that's all I got for today.